rare are there cars that come along that are such aspirational cars as the Focus RS, but yet are affordable. They're actually within the budgets of most enthusiasts. It's trying to be more livable, much like the Golf R would be. It's got various different drive modes, it's got all of the latest tech, but at the same time, it's also trying to do torque vectoring all-wheel drive like the Mitsubishi Evo has done kind of forever. Yep, here's the Evo once again. I know you're shocked, but the reason it's here is because it's conspicuous without it. As many cars as journalists drive, yes, you have memories about how a car feels, but nothing beats jumping directly from one car into another, and so we had to bring the Evo 10. It's actually pretty fascinating to get into this Evo with this company because you instantly see its benefits and its flaws. Again, as we like to say, there's no perfect car, but this STI has delivered such fun, and that's the point of driving these. We're just looking for the fun. So here we are back in the Golf R. We put this up against the Subaru STI last year, and unfortunately that version we had was a DSG, and we didn't like it as much as we wanted to. We have the six-speed manual finally, thank you. And it is significantly better. It gets you far more involved. This level of refinement is unique to this price point and unique to the car. Not many other cars deliver like this one will. We're a small outlet and we love what we do. For YouTube, we do these big comparisons like the one you're about to see, but we also do single cars with our fast blasts and long turns. Outside YouTube, once a year we make a huge feature film. From the only full retrospective of the 911's first 50 years, to a celebration of affordable exotics and amazing roads, to the ultimate enthusiast road trip across Germany. Plus, every week we do an audio podcast, The Car Debate, where we help you find a fun car that fits your situation. So we hope you'll join us for all of it. Subscribe, please make comments, and make sure to share. The Ford Focus RS is a revised ST. The telltale signs are the more aggressive front fascia, rear wing, and badges, but mostly the paint color. If you look closely, you can see the gold-colored flakes in the paint. It sits just right, and I think it would turn your head even if it wasn't painted this gorgeous nitrous blue. The Golf tells you what it is by having an R badge. But that's the problem. It's the most subtle car of the bunch, and it doesn't telegraph its intentions. Apart from the quad tailpipes, this car is a GTI. The STI is supposed to be blue with gold wheels. However, the black is kind of subtle and helps this car. I didn't think something as simple as a color choice could affect my perception of the STI but it suits the car better than the traditional Subaru Blue. This is a weapon. This design has been around for a long time. Swollen fenders do a lot for this car, but you know what? In this group of four, it holds its own quite well. I want to say it looks the same as it always has, but it's gotten worse. They've taken the turn signal off the quarter panel, put it on the mirror, and they filled in the gap with a Buick stick-on from AutoZone. Is it necessary to discuss the interior of the Evo? It's low rent. Mitsubishi pulled out the great seats we were expecting, and so now, you might as well leave the windows down when you go through a car wash and get everyone clean at the same time. The STI tells you Subaru is trying really hard with what they have. It's not the prettiest interior, but there's tons of space in here. There's nothing you have to study for a moment and figure out. No new stylistic ground was broken with this car, but it is instantly useful. The Golf wins on interior. Even the base Golf has a nice interior, so the R just has a head start. This is the car you want to be in all the time, and if you have long distances to cover, 
This car beats everything else here, no problem. This leaves us with the Focus ST, I mean the RS, because it's essentially the same interior with some blue stitching and RS badges. The seats, the stitching, and RS logos everywhere are the only giveaways. It's well built and it feels sturdy, but it wouldn't pass the blindfold test. Okay, it's a Focus ST in here, right? It just is. It, there's nothing remarkable. The mechanicals are where all the money went and the little yellow gold flake in the paint. Besides that, it's all about these mechanicals. Now this is an all new all wheel drive system for Ford. It actually can send about 70% of the power to the rear wheels and then split that pretty much 100% either way toward those back wheels. So there is a lot of movement going on in the power. We can make the argument about this car shedding some pounds, but it's still within a few hundred pounds of every car here. It's average in terms of weight, but it's very not average in terms of power. When you're moving fast, the other cars can carry their speed, but there is a point where this one starts to walk away just a little bit. This is the 2.3 liter four cylinder turbo that they're using, sorry, EcoBoost that they're using in the Ford Mustang right now. But here it's been cranked up to 350 all around, 350 horsepower, 350 torque, which you look at that compared to the other cars we have here, and that is a significant bump up. However, when you start driving them together, you're not at a loss in the other cars, and suddenly this feels powerful. In spite of the stats, they all feel pretty similar in that area. At low speeds, it's a base golf. That's what these settings here, the modes, so starting with comfort, this should actually say a golf. And then we move to GTI. And if you wanna transform your car into ideally a lot more than just a GTI, that's why you go into race mode. Oh. <laughs> Ding, it should make you sign a waiver digitally every time you really turn everything off. <laughs> it's nice to be back here on a great road in the six-speed Golf R. I have to say, it's quite endearing. I do like it a lot. Now, this is by far the easiest six-speed to use, and by that I mean it takes almost no effort. The clutch is a feather. The gear shift you could do with your pinky. With a gearbox this easy, I'm not entirely sure why you even need the DSG, unless all you really are doing is commuting. Now this is one of the least powerful cars in this test, but if you really throw it down a road behind that RS, you can't really tell. You do have to just wring its neck though to get the performance you're hoping for out of it. Come on, come on, there we go. Of all the engines, this is the most disappointing for me. It's the characteristics of how it revs. It's the most sluggish here. You have to wait a beat. It, it doesn't really happily just, hey, let's go, let's go, come on, come on, come on, come on. It feels like an economy car, well-designed and well-built, no doubt, that is being coaxed into performance. And it's sort of got bed head and it's just woken up and you're convincing it. You're shoving a cup of coffee in its hand. And you're convincing it that let's go, we've got to drive, we've got to go fast, we've got to go do something. And it just seems very reluctant, it, reluctant to rev. When you're holding a gear and holding the revs, the engine will do just fine. It makes great power, but I need something more. And now, I know that can be fixed, but my question for you is why didn't Volkswagen fix it? Why didn't Volkswagen do something to make the motor more aggressive and happy and eager? Now you may be saying, wait, I could go get that Golf tuned, and yes, you could, but you could go get the other cars tuned as well. I don't have a problem with tuning, but I think it should be as fun as you hoped for, kind of right out of the box. I wish with the R that Volkswagen would just let it all hang out. They would just decide, okay, we may be German, but let's get nuts. It's funny, when we're gravitating towards cars, 
the STI is one of the two that I just naturally want to get in. Of course, the power is glorious. I do like the sound. This is the same essential recipe Subaru's done since dinosaurs roamed the earth. It's the two and a half liter. It's turbocharged to around 300 horsepower. I mean, look at your stat sheets. This really isn't drifting off into the weeds at all. Oh, still quick though, still quick. Here's Subaru with their all four wheels all the time, classic lockdown all wheel drive. Now because it's the STI, you can alter it a little bit. I always push it a little bit toward the rear. That helps me with the steering feel up front. It's in sport sharp. The throttle response is instantaneous, regardless of the engine speed. As soon as you give it a little bit of throttle, it wants to go. very fast. Now the power on the Evo is still, as I remember, high strung, noisy, very much like we remember turbos from the 80s. It's all or nothing. Come on, two liter, there you go. Get up on the boost and now we're moving. All right. The Evo is technically the lowest horsepower, heaviest car here but you would never know it. This does have 300 pound-feet of torque, which places it only behind the RS. But one of the things I'm shocked by, especially in this whole group, is how urgent this car feels. The problem is it's only five gears. On the freeway, it makes for a horrible experience. I don't want to be on a road in this car unless it's one like this. I don't want to be on the freeway. I don't want to commute. I don't want to do anything else but drive like this. You can only get a six speed if you get their dual clutch, which candidly is a great dual clutch. Yes, on a tiny Mitsubishi Evo. That's a real conundrum and always has been with the Evo. On one hand, you get a brilliant dual clutch transmission. On the other, it's not a manual, but the only one available is this five speed that is entirely obsolete. How about this? How about we don't retire the car, we just retire the gearbox? Can we do that? Can we get a six-speed manual in here and a slightly better interior? We could do these things. I would be a very happy person for a long time yet. And you'd look at the stats and you'd think, this is the slowest one. Heaviest, least horsepower, and the stats would be wrong. This Evo is the most urgent car here. It feels genuinely quick, and the other ones don't walk away. The power is really high on the RS. I want it to be a little more aggressive at tip-in. I want it suddenly just a bit more. Not that I'm saying I want the, the light switch of a turbo, but I want it to be more aggressive initially. What's funny about this engine in this configuration is, is the torque is about as linear as humanly possible. I mean, wherever you are in the power band, you put your foot in it, it feels just about as powerful as it did 1,000 RPM in either direction. If you look at a dyno sheet for this car, it looks like somebody was learning to draw a square. That's all the torque does. With modern turbos, it can now be tuned to just be a solid rush, a solid wall of power. The power doesn't snap your neck back. It isn't a light switch like some older cars <clears throat> that we have with us today. The Evo does have terrible turbo lag, especially for a modern car. This doesn't feel like it's got much, but this still feels like a lot of times when you come up from a dig, the engine just doesn't feel all that urgent. In spite of having that torque curve that really operates as a table, you, you do have to keep it on boil a little bit in a way that you don't in the Evo. Yeah, this doesn't feel like it exits a corner with the authority that the Evo has, which is really surprising considering the power deficit. That is. I did feel some torque steer there getting on it. Interesting. Ford has done their best, including adding a rigid knuckle to eliminate torque steer or get rid of that feel. I felt it a little bit there, and maybe that's to be not unexpected, but... This Golf is one of the two with the RS that have electric steering in this test, and that means it is a variable steering rack. And while I don't have a problem with electric steering, I do feel like the variable racks really don't give you much actual tire information. This is really no different. 
The struggle for the Golf R is in many ways it's the GTI with just a few extra little things. Now I know you're saying it has all wheel drive. Yes, but it has the Haldex system, which is predominantly a front wheel drive car that throws power to the rear when it's necessary. Sometimes coming out of corners, you punch it and you can feel that back half of the car is helping you out in a way that the Performance Pack GTI can't, but it never feels as dialed in or helpful as the all-wheel drives from these other three cars. It tracks well. It really does. And it's compliant over those bumps. I would have been hating myself in other cars on some of these undulations, even though it's a very comfortable, fast car. I want some character. I want something to make me just laugh out loud as if I didn't know the car could do that thing. The steering feel is muted here. It's there. It holds a line. But it also feels as if the Golf R is placating you a little bit. I'm loving driving like this. But somewhere the car has to be convinced of that. The struggle for the Golf R in this company specifically is that these are all pretty focused and aggressive driving machines. That's not really what Volkswagen does. Now the Golf is actually the lightest car here and in fact it is by a tiny margin the shortest wheelbase. Now those benefits are muted a bit by the fact that this is the car that's the most compliant. It is the nicest ride. Even in this race setting it is not nearly as aggressive as these other cars. Every one of us Shooters included, Chance and Edgar included, kind of mentioned about this car and thought it's a soft, fast car. The wet blanket of refinement has gotten in the way. Now, you can say, you can ask me, what's the balance then? How do car companies balance the two? When you're talking all-wheel drive performance cars, the first thing that should pop into your head shouldn't be, wow, this is comfortable. It's the same thing as saying, if you're judging a swimsuit contest, the first thing that goes into your mind is, she's very intelligent. It just, it doesn't mean it's not valuable, it just isn't what we're looking for. <laughs> this STI is something else. Ooh, I'm feeling the back end come around there a little bit. <laughs> All right, so I'm reminded of all the reasons I love this STI. Now, going through the corners, there are a few areas where I feel like this snapback in the steering. See, right through mid-corner here, it just feels vague to me. If you've driven an STI before, this feels like that one. I, I, it really actually does feel quite similar. Now, this, this generation does add torque vectoring, which isn't quite as elegant as the systems on the RS. We've talked about it before. You get yourself in a constant radius, long sweeper of a corner, and you can feel it just kind of tugging at the wheel. It is a little bit disconcerting until you get used to it. Now, you can adjust your center diff a little bit. You can take yourself as far back as possible. That mutes that problem some. It creates kind of an interesting mixed bag with the steering, because this STI does have hydraulic steering. It's one of only two here that still offers that. And so it does give you tire information, but then it's fighting you with its torque vectoring. It's easy, I feel like, to lose a little bit of confidence mid-corner. The, the feel goes away right here. That stringy, rubber bandy, snapback feel is, that's the most off-putting part of this car for me. The initial turn-in is very aggressive. And then things lighten up. So with the STI, I'm finding that it is requiring the smoothest driving techniques of any of the four cars here. I feel like some of the other cars, you can slam a shifter home, you can kind of have a bobble mid-corner, but the STI demands that you are really on it. This STI is the largest car here. It's the longest with a wheelbase that pretty much matches everybody else. But it is really spacious in here. In fact, if you're going to take four people, this is the one you want to be in. The result is you can feel this as the largest car. It feels like the biggest car in this test. Interestingly enough, though, it's also the second lightest. In spite of all the all-wheel drive running gear going on here, this is not a porker. 3,400 pounds, a lot of cars without all-wheel drive can't pull that off, including two in this group. Now, it is a very light, it's almost over-assisted rack. One of the things that keeps it from being over-assisted is the fact those front wheels are also pulling on the wheel as well. But otherwise, it can be surprisingly light. The only real downfall here is that tug that happens as it tries to do torque vectoring.
Uh, the Evo. It's actually right through the corner. I'm going to say it has the most feedback of any of these cars. It's old. It's retired. But the old dog still has tricks. I'm trying not to look down here at the screen that shows me what my super all-wheel control is doing. I'm trying really hard to keep my eyes away from that screen. But the truth is, it's working magic. There's not a shred of disconnect between you and the corner. That's astounding. It drives brilliantly well. It handles very well. And I am... I'm loving this, but I don't like anything else about the car now. Ugh. The seats are, you see how far I'm leaning? I mean, <laughs> they're, they're ridiculous is what they are. It does hang on, except you don't anymore. Such directness in this car. Such a one trick pony now. It's tragic, but it's actually quite a trick. The closest competitor to the way the Evo deals with power in the corner isn't any of these cars. It's actually the GTR. This is one of those cars, like the big Nissan, that you have to drive kind of differently if you really want to drive it fast. If you let off the gas and you roll through a corner, you will find understeer. But if you just charge into a corner, just stick it in there and put your foot down, it sorts itself out. It's surreal. None of the other three can do that. I am truly shocked. As much time has gone by and as old as this car has gotten, that it still has the best handling powertrain of this group. This is like a bunch of little kids picking on some retired old guy and they don't realize that he's a retired assassin. There's not an ounce of slop in this car. Except the seats. I'm telling you, this is ridiculous. Along with the fuel tank, the fuel tank is what's ridiculous. They put all the money in the power train and then they realize that an economy car size fuel tank doesn't cut it for a performance car like this. This is like driving a garbage disposal. That's what I feel like when I'm driving around in this car. It's fun, but I want to get out. not have a good turning radius but now we're in track mode wow this car is even sharper it's rare that we can feel such a difference between modes this is one of them now for my drive modes I have normal because you know that happens sport which is better angrier a little bit looser on the trash control much better throttle response but then you also have track, and it tightens down the suspension and gives you a little bit more leeway with the trash control. The trash control thing is welcome. The tightened suspension, frankly, isn't. Um, but Ford even thought of that, thankfully. And right here on the end of the turn signal stalk, you can change the suspension dampers back to their less aggressive setting while keeping everything else in track mode. Thank you, Ford. I'm sure that the extra stiff suspension is wonderful on an actual track, but I have backed off the dampers back to normal people setting because I'm not on a track and ow. This is the kind of steering feel that I've been asking for, for the type of weight and feedback because it does change. It changes with what I'm doing. It changes with the car's setting. And there's none of this vagueness through the corner. It's still precise and it's still heavy. So normal and drift use a looser steering feel. And that drift thing, throwing all the power to the back, by the way, is pretty cool. You don't see that on any other car and Ford is pretty proud of themselves for putting that on here. We should discuss drift mode. I know what you're thinking. Why isn't this an entire video of tire smoke? Because that's not reality. Yes, it's a way to get the back out. It throws 70% of the power to the rear wheels. It makes the steering looser. It makes the suspension looser. So everything's a little bit more wobbly and you can just chuck it in and bring the ass around. At some point, if you own this car, you're going to realize that's a gimmick because it's great to watch some journalist who's not paying for tires completely take them to the courts for fun. But Pilot Super Sports are great tires and help this car be everything that it is. But they're also not cheap. 
And once you're paying for your own tires, you might show off a few times, you might try it out, but generally you're probably not going to use it. Of course, while the drift mode is designed for you to be able to chuck it in and create a drift, it's not like you set that setting and suddenly you're sliding around on lunch trays in the back. It's still something where these are Pilot Super Sports, you're going to have to intend to do it. It's just set up the whole chassis to be more prone to do it. It's one of the most surprising dynamic realizations of this car is to be in drift mode without necessarily trying to drift and to realize the personality of the car totally changes. You can make this little hot hatch feel like a big rear wheel drive muscle car where it's a car that there's a lot of body roll, it feels a little loose, but you know you can't get your foot on it out of that corner too early otherwise it'll swing the back out, which is really bizarre to feel in a little hatchback like this. I really like it, honestly. Steering feel-wise, this is an incredibly tight steering rack, only two turns lock to lock. Now it's electric, which means you're not really feeling much, but my god, it's fast. It's not a Lotus, and I'm saying that to Todd more than the rest of you. It's got 60% of the weight on the front wheels, so okay, we're accepting that with how the car is. I feel more composed than in any other car here. The ride quality is better even though it's stiff. It's forgiving through some of the corners that you might screw up. It's encouraging you to do more. And you can clearly tell that if we were not on a mountain road and we had runoff areas for track, it could do even better. There's none of the vagueness mid-corner that I find in the Subaru. There's none of the lackadaisical, it steers, but I just don't want to reveal my full personality like I find in the Golf R. It is most similar in a lot of ways to the Evo. So this is Ford venturing into this torque vectoring world that the Evo has had for a while, where you can throw power to the wheel in need. I do come to the realization that you can feel what this car's thinking. You can tell that it's pushing power around. It's not as seamless or invisible as it is in the Evo. Now I know, I'm shocked to say that as you are to hear it. I'm kind of aware that it's doing trickery. The Evo has just already done it. All right, yep, I'm feeling the torque steer a little bit. And the back's coming around. <laughs> I'm not even drift mode. I know it's assisting me, I know it's throwing some power around, but this is giving you the mechanical feel of the car all by itself. It's letting you feel the engineering. I'm used to that on hotter cars and more expensive cars. And Ford has done it here, they really have. But this one is checking a lot of boxes. If it is parked, an RS is suddenly a tragedy. You've got to be out here putting miles on your cars. We fought for this. Ever yeah, since did. the RS was announced, we were talking about these four cars together. We never talked about anything but these four cars. We wanted to put the RS with all the competitors, which means, let's be honest, we're bringing the grandfather. We've seen other comparisons that do not include the Evo, but this is a car you can't ignore in this lineup if you're all shopping. All-wheel drive performance cars, 40 grand, hello? Still such a benchmark. Absolutely. It was surprising and fun to drive it again, despite the age. Yeah, I was shocked at how old that technology is and how well it's held up. You've heard us just now talking about the Focus RS and you're asking yourselves, is it the best car here? But people know you for always picking the latest, greatest, the most technology came out last week. That's the car you pick. But keep this in mind. This is not technology applied to unobtainable cars at a price we That's can't true. afford. That's true. But this is accessible. And this is why it I is. think you're everybody right. is so gaga about the car. It's not the new McLaren, it's not the new thing that's unattainable. Ooh. We, as enthusiasts, can afford this car and drive this car. So it's your favorite? It's my favorite. Okay, but... <laughs> okay, surprise is over. Thanks for watching. Good Bruh. to have you here. But <laughs> where, where's the rest of the group, though? The STI is a tiny hair, tiny step behind this in terms of okay. fun. Yeah. Because I asked myself the entire time we were driving these cars, am I having fun? Little things that distract. And the short distract. answer was yes, 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 well, we were. Yes, of on. course. But the things that distract us, like the bad seats in this, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. things like that that just distract you from really focusing on things that you really enjoy. However, the STI is just a tiny step behind. The thing I kept thinking, I thought about this two ways. One of my thought was, if this was your only car, 
and what you mostly do is commute, and every now and then you might take a fun drive, you want the Golf R. Yeah, now, get it in true. a stick, but you want the Golf R. That's it's true. It's the best car for that. It's the best place to be. But we're back here just looking for fun. So if you're looking for fun, the whole equation switches, yeah. and I realize the Evo's still the most fun. I can't believe I'm saying that. It's, it's ancient. But in just sheer dynamics, it wins. Now, I have to acknowledge. Debatable. I Debatable. I have to acknowledge. I think it's still better dynamically than this. However. So you have two scales then. I have, I have to, but then I have to go, OK, let's open up all the list of reasons why the Evo right. has to be excused. Right. And I go RS, because it has almost as nice a place to be as the Golf. And it's, it's a stutter step behind as good to drive as the Evo. But it felt so far more progressive to me. And combining the elements that we love of the other three into this one, it's sort of, it's, if only, we keep asking, you know, if only they did this, this, and this, it'd be this car. It's a fantastic blending of the good parts of all of these. Yeah. I mean, you know what dawns on me? This car is gonna become the S2000 for all-wheel drive performance cars. It's gonna die, and cars are gonna keep getting made, and people are gonna go, but what about the Evo, like we do with the S2000 and convertibles? As the benchmark, what you're talking about, Absolutely. Absolutely. It's definitely going to hang out there in this world. I mean, you're welcome to argue with us. Of course you will. That's what the <laughs> internet is for, right? But here's the thing. All four of these back to back, I still can't believe we did it. I want to go drive them some more well, because we, we when is this to. going to happen again? Uh, debatable and doubtful because this, this still exists. It's lurking. Why didn't I buy an Evo yet? Why didn't I do that? I'm not sure. Maybe, I'm stupid. Maybe, maybe I'll buy an RS. This is your car. The Golf R is always on its tiptoes. It's always dancing around, but it's as if it's a ballerina that's had a really long night and you have to convince it and plead, please show me your skills, please. I really don't feel like you should buy your all-wheel drive performance car and then have to go tune it to make it fun. It should just be fun right out of the box. In isolation, the Golf R does really well. With these other three, it's, it's just not as fun. Subaru has sorted this car so well. I'm delightfully reminded why this car is still tops on my list. There's problems with it. I didn't really love driving on the freeway in it. I didn't really love just kind of puttering around town. I feel like with every year that passes for these cars, why not continue to tweak and refine and make a little bit better? I realize that the Evo is no longer being made, but the RS is asking you to revise everything about this. I'd like to see what Subaru can do if they put their mind to, how can we revolutionize the STI? It's not bad, it's just, I know it can be more. Here is a car that is almost now plain Jane in its execution compared to all these other three cars. It's still brilliant and it can still hustle and it still holds its own, but only on the track and only on a road like this. The rest of the car is mind-numbingly horrible because they've put these seats in now. They've given up on life. Every time I drive one, I have a serious conversation with myself about why I don't own one yet. I am truly stunned to drive the Evo again next to the RS and realize this still corners better. That's, I'm amazed. That, that shouldn't be possible. It should have been beat by now, and it hasn't been. Wins, loses in almost every other category you can think of. <laughs> Are we having fun yet? <laughs> it's true. Everything you're reading and talking about and saying, it's true. All of the things that I've wanted these other cars to do are finally realized in the RS. And for this to be this good and separating itself so far from its competitors so quickly, that's why the RS wins. It's not a direct replacement for the Evo because it, it gets close, but it doesn't quite rotate like that car does. It's not a better replacement for the Golf R because it doesn't have an interior that's quite that nice. It's not quite as quiet and nice a place to be as the Golf R if you get in a full commute situation. It's almost the best of both those cars. It's so close to overlapping them both completely that it makes it the winner.
Don't forget to subscribe for videos on Thursdays.